Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to present on Fall Armyworm. Um, I, I think this particular pest has had people rightfully concerned um, because it has a reputation that precedes it. And it, since it's been found only recently in Australia, people are, are worried. In, in Gippsland in particular, um, where there's a lot of dairy industry, uh, the potential for it to do damage to uh, grazing and pasture crops for dairy is uh, of con significant concern. And we'll talk about that as we go through. So about full armyworm or four as we affectionately call it, it is a worldwide pest. Um, it comes from South America or the Americas, and um, it has uh, been able to establish pretty much all over um, the um, tropical, subtropical parts of the world. It's very destructive. Um, when larvae are numerous, they can default, default, defoliate lots of plants. Um, they disperse in very large numbers um, and they acquire this kind of, the reason why they're called army worm is that they acquire this kind of army habitat where they are in large numbers and they march and they eat everything in their path. They're also uh, able to disperse long distances and they're highly invasive, which means they're highly adaptable, they're generalists and they tolerate a lot of different conditions. They even benefit from some conditions like cultivation or um, fire. They have a very fast reproductive cycle and there's many host plant species. A lot of um, Literature records 350 species, although that number has been disputed. So as I said, they're um, tropical and subtropical. Um, and I don't know if you can read the numbers there on the top screen. Um, from 2016 and before, they were found just in, in the Americas. I don't know why Canada's marked on there. I think it's just because it goes up to about Texas and Florida. Um, perhaps there's a few instances higher up, but not, not usually. It's just mostly around um, the middle latitudes. And by 2016, it was all over Africa. And it pretty much took only a year to do that. In 2017, uh, more of Africa, sorry, a couple of years to do that. Then 2018, it moved towards Asia, 2019, Southeast Asia, and in 2020, it came to Australia. It was first identified on the tip of Cape York Peninsula in February, 2020. By July, it had traveled, you know, mostly down the coast of both the Northern Territory and Queensland and WA. And by December 2020, it had got all the way to Victoria. Um, the first instance of it being in Victoria was that December 2020 incursion, uh, which was in Orbost in Gippsland. Uh, by April 2021, it was found in Tasmania as well on the north coast. So yes, it has the ability to disperse long distances. Um, adults can fly, it's a fairly strong flyer, but they can also migrate on um, winds of up to 500 kilometers or more. And as I said, it's highly invasive. It has a fast reproductive cycle. Um, 
in the tropics, four to six generations and the life cycles more or less continuous. And it takes um, anywhere between 30 and sort of 60 days to go through one cycle, depending on the conditions. In temperate regions, there's usually only one or two generations. And lastly, it has numerous host plants. So 350, as I said, that's disputed. 76 plant families have been nominated, but it does have a preference for poaceae, which is the grasses and grains, cereals. Um, seconded by Asteraceae, which is um, the daisy family, but includes horticultural species like sunflower, artichokes and lettuce and for base, which is the legumes. So things like beans and lentils. So there are, um, in the literature, they talk about the rice strain, the R strain and the corn strain, the C strain, and they, but they are morphologically identical. Um, they can only really be distinguished by molecular analysis. Uh, we initially thought we had the corn strain in Australia, but recent research has shown that we have more of a hybrid strain. They, they prefer maize and sweet corn uh, more than anything. So even the rice strain will eat corn first if it's available, because it um, tastes nicer, I suppose. Um, but we, we are seeing hybrids in in throughout their invasive range so we really don't have a good handle on host cross crop preferences and mating behavior in Australia um, because it's only been here for such a short time overseas research says that it favors these crops most um, in order, maize, sweet corn, sorghum, C4 pasture grasses. So in Australia, that's things like kangaroo grass, native sorghum, love grass, umbrella grass, wire grass, and then sugarcane and rice. And crop losses have been seen overseas uh, in large numbers in corn and sorghum. In terms of Victoria, these are the detections that we've had um, in Orbos, the, that was the first one, and then it was subsequently found in two other locations in near Bansdale and up in the northern parts of Victoria. We've had, oh, sorry, we had um, a lot of other people report, but they've either turned out to be um, negative, which is good, or um, they were unconfirmed, which means we didn't have any, any samples and there were no photos and, that we could sort of confirm. Not that it's easy to um, tell from photos. Um, and as I was saying before, we really like, would like people to report it just to get a handle on the prevalence in Victoria, because we really don't know what it's going to do down here in a more temperate environment. So you can report that through the um, exotic plant pest hotline or through this um, public reporting form, which is on the internet, and that's the URL for there. Or you can just go to the AgVic website and find it through there. So really getting trying to get an understanding of um, how it will establish and spread in Australia and uh, work has been done by James Maino from Caesar so looking into sort of he's looking into the regions of Australia where um, permanent all-year populations are likely to persist and where seasonal populations only will persist. And you can see in there, um, in Victoria, those, uh, 
um, regions in Victoria, the, um, those conditions are only likely to occur throughout sort of January, February, March, summer, summer and coming into autumn. You know, once you get to about April, those conditions become much less favourable for fall armyworm in Victoria. And it may just simply be that it's too cold for it to, to make any kind of a dint. Um, so when we're doing scouting, for example, for fall armyworm, the, we would be not looking um, until sort of shortly before crop emergence in spring and then throughout the summer. So winter crops then are fairly safe. Um, so this is it's quite an extensive study that um, James Mayno et al did um, doing this. And uh, there is another study which really sums it up quite nicely, even though it's a, a different study altogether using different data um, or different parameters, I should say. And basically what it's saying is uh, in the orange areas, it's going to persist all year round. In the yellow, it'll be it'll be there in all seasons except for winter. And in the green, it's present sometimes in some years, um, from mid spring through summer and into autumn. So we in Victoria, we can be fairly sort of confident that we may not see it every year, and if we do. Um, it will perhaps not be as bad as it will be in the northern states because the um, number of generations will be less. So I guess this talk is more about preparedness in, in advance of summer. Um, so I'm just going to go over a few things that can be done to prepare. The first is early detection, which is absolutely critical to ensure any effective control. And the first thing that um, you need to do is scouting for eggs, which are, is that photo on the left. Now egg masses are laid under the leaves and they have this um, fluffy looking appearance, which is actually a protective layer of the abdominal bristles from the adult. They're laid in um, numbers of about 100 to 300 in batches, but they're very, very small. Um, you really have to look quite hard to see them. You can also look for the neonates, which is the um, early hatching uh, worms. They look, they have this sort of pinkish tinge to them and they have a very dark head. So they're quite easy to see, but again, they're very, very small. Um, and it's good to look for these things when you know um, migration may be occurring or just before crops in spring. The other way that you can monitor for them is through pheromone baited traps. These are suspended at the canopy level and they're to detect early moth arrival. So they're detecting the adults and adult activity in a region before they lay the eggs. It is quite hard to see these things with the naked eye. It's probably easier to look for actual damage from the fall armyworm. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that depending on the stage of the insect. So the early instar, um, which is there's um, six instars that they go through, which are um, six growth stages getting bigger all the time. So the early instars are very tiny ones. Um, will have this, will produce this windowing effect on the leaves where they just sort of don't chew through the leaves but produce a um, sort of opaque kind of 
quality to the leaves. You can kind of see through them. That's why they call it windowing. Um, Median stars will chew the leaves and, and you result in these shot holes. But in large numbers, they'll also actually chew leaves off altogether. And the late instar larvae, you'll be able to see because they're quite big, but um, you may not be able to notice them because they'll be inside the whirl of the plant. And, but you may see the frass. Um, fall army and produce a lot of frass, which is the excrement or poo from feeding. And often you'll notice the frass before you notice the insect itself. So, looking for fall army worm is, is in the crop is great, but you need to be careful that you're not picking up something that's not fall armyworm. Um, Australia has a lot of different kinds of what we call armyworms. They all have a, diff, uh, the same, a similar mode of, of being. So these pictures were taken, and I've taken these from um, one of the researchers in Queensland who's done a lot of work on fall armyworms since it arrived there. Um, all of these photographs uh, are taken, look similar to fall armyworm, but they're not. They're native fall armyworm or they're uh, sort of native armyworm, sorry, Heliocoverpa species. Um, and can, can be easily mistaken for fall armyworm. And it's very important that you don't mistake them because when you uh, do control measures um, and target the wrong species that can have all sorts of impacts on resistance management. The other difference that I wanted to point out, this is a, a tweet that somebody sent out, the difference between Heliothus, which is Heliocoverpa, um, the one that we're most worried about is Heliocoverpa amidra, which is the coal, the cotton bollworm. Um, the damage that Heliothus does on the left here in the left hand photo um, is sort of at the one end of the corn, whereas the fall armyworm will burrow right into the middle of the corn. So as I said, it's really, really important to, to know what species of armyworm you do have. And there are a lot of publications online that indicate the special characteristics of fall armyworms in terms of diagnostics. Um, and I'll just go through the ones that are talked about most. So the four smaller dark spots on the end of the caterpillar of a late instar caterpillar, a mature caterpillar is diagnostic as is the trapeze pattern, the four spots in a trapeze pattern um, in the sort of second segment from the end. There's also a dark, usually dark head, but sometimes not with a Y shape. Um, you can't see it readily on this picture, but more readily on this one, this Y shape on the head is indicative of fall armyworm. And in the adults, but only in the males, uh, the colour of the forewings and these spots on the forewings uh, are distinctive of fall armyworm. But having said that, it is fairly difficult for people to, to identify fall armyworm. Like adults in particular look like all other kind of heliovert Heliocoverpa adults and can only really definitively be identified through um, molecular analysis or, or um, looking at the male genitalia, dissecting the male genitalia out, which can only really be done in a lab by uh, an experienced entomologist. So we would encourage people who think they may have fall armyworm to send it in a sample 
um, through to our diagnostic service to get it actually ID'd. So what can we, once we know it's fall armyworm, what should we do? There's a couple of different methods. Um, in Africa, uh, they've tried crushing the egg masses by hand, if you can find them, and removing larvae by hand, but that only really works if it's a, a small infestation and you know, not if there's large properties involved either. Um, chemical management is the usual method of control. And the important thing to note here is to target the early instar stages. So the um, first and second instar, the new, newly hatched uh, caterpillars before they become entrenched in the crop, which is, you know, embedded in the whorls and for example. And that, that makes it fairly difficult to know that you've got full armyworm because the first and second instar stages are very difficult to identify and separate from other armyworms. So it is a good idea to send in a sample and get it um, diagnosed by an entomologist. Um, the problem with the chemical control is that broad spectrum chemistry is in likely, unlikely to be effective because uh, there's lots of formal armyworm that are resistant and also helicoverpa have um, developed resistant and there's been a lot of work done prior to fall armyworm coming into Australia on managing that resistance in helicoverpa crops. So employing um, IPM strategies to manage that resistance. What, what we're worried about now is people indiscriminately using broad, broad spectrum chemistries to um, manage full armyworm that may actually destroy all the good work that's been done with uh, other armyworm resistance. Hi, La. Yes. Could I just jump in for a moment? I'm just conscious of time. Um, it's 10 past one. So if, if we can just keep... Okay. This, I know sure. this is really important stuff. I don't want you to rush over it too much, but... Um, I think I'm... I think there's only a couple more slides. Cool, thanks. Um, the, I guess the other thing to note is that there are a number of natural enemies um, for fall armyworm, predators, parasitoids and fungi that have been used overseas and are probably going to be useful here. We just don't know yet. We don't know enough about whether they're going to work or not in Australia. Um, so we'll be looking towards uh, the work done in Queensland um, to do to, to discover whether that's going to work or not. And again, <clears throat> it's very important not to use chemicals unless a, a threshold has been reached. This, I've taken this from, this is the US threshold table. So for example, for maize, they recommend you don't um, use chemicals unless you have three or more larvae per plant or 50% of the plant has got, um, is affected by fresh feeding. But again, these are thresholds from overseas they're based on different sets of circumstances and economics, but they're the best bet that we have for local experience until the research has been done for um, in Australia to establish our own thresholds. So I just wanted to quickly go through um, what government and industry are doing on a national level. We are, are trying to develop faster diagnostic tools, for example, in field tools like LAMP that we can be used to detect, to know whether you've got full armyworm or not. We have 
been um, engaging in lots of opportunities overseas for biocontrol, genetic analysis of um, fall armyworm and insecticide and resistant fall armyworm in Australia is being done. Uh, we're also looking at effective chemical controls with the APVMA, the um, Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority, and extension workshops like this uh, for best practice. So I guess that we'll be relying on uh, Queensland for a lot of this research because we're just not going to see enough of it in Victoria, it's not really the place to do research. But the one thing that we will be looking at is the ability of the pest to survive the winter in Victoria. So I guess that's it from me. The last slide is just um, for your own benefit, I guess, useful resources. Uh, Agriculture Victoria has updates on their website. They have, um, if you wanna send in a sample, you can go to this URL, um, fill in a form and send in a sample to tell you what to do there. CESA has done a lot of work and if you look on their website you'll get some good notes. There's a really good video from Melina Wiles in Queensland who's done a lot of work since it, since it arrived in Queensland. There's a really good grains Research and Development Corporation publication, but probably the best one I've come across is this Fall Arming Worm Continuity Plan, which was put out by PHA, but it was a collaboration between the Queensland Government, Gerdic, Caesar and Cabby, uh, and has, you know, really good, concise information about um, what you should do and how to, you know, how to identify it, all of that kind of stuff. So thank you. Thanks, Kyla. That's great. Um, and maybe if you, if you could share that last slide, especially, or probably the whole thing, but that last slide in particular, I'll send those yep. links out to everyone because they look like some really useful resources. Okay. Um, yeah, it's cool to hear what else AgVit's up to.